Okay, so we're going to look at four problems tonight. I picked them because they help us with certain big topics. Uh, so glad we can make it. Uh, we'll see how far we get. Again, if you need to move your desk, please let's not make these groups. You actually took a bag of chips. Three pure solid compounds labeled X, Y, and Z are placed on a lab bench with the objective of identifying each one. So these kinds of problems, by the way, before I even start reading them, it's a lot of uh, reaction chemistry. It can bleed into many different things before I even start getting into some of the uh, questions. So it, it's a wide range. That's a positive and a negative. Because if you're really good at one topic, then you kind of want it to keep in that area. But what's nice is it you struggle at something, which you're all going to run into a problem. You're like, oh, no, I don't see the connection. You know you're going to get out of that and get into something else. Okay? It says, uh, the unknown, uh, it is known that the compounds listed in random order are KCl, Na2CO3, and MgSO4. A student per, uh, performed several tests on the compound. The results are summarized in the table below. So I just put the table up so we can talk about that, and I'm going to write uh, below that. So you've got X, Y, and Z, pH of an aqueous solution of a compound greater than or equal to seven for the other two, uh, resulting in adding one molar NaOH. So if I add NaOH to it, no obser uh, observed reaction, no observed reaction, made it precipitate. And then lastly, if I added HCl, uh, it made gas, no observation, no observation. Okay? So that's where we're at. So A, identify each compound based on the observations recorded in the table. Wow, right away. We're just going. So here's X, here's Y, here's Z. So, does anybody have any ideas of which one could be which? There's usually one, just suggestion, there's always one that you can probably figure out faster than the other two. Let me just point out an obvious idea here, is that there's a difference between pH of one of them versus the other two, right? There's a difference between adding NaOH versus the other two, and there's one difference between HCl versus the other two. So that's kind of a huge indication. So, does anybody know which one would be greater than 7 for a pH? Hunter, sorry if I'm changing. Your, your, I, I, I know you had your hand in before I asked my specific question. I don't know. The, the reason why I want to talk about that one, that to me is the easiest one because I don't have to look at reactions. Nate? Would that be Na2CO3? Okay, so I'm going to hold that thought. Let's see if you're right. What we do, it's a trick. How do we figure out the pH of a salt when you add it into water? What do you do with each part of that? Remember this? So you got NaCl or Na2CO3, whatever. We take the first one and add OH to it. And you take the second one and put an H in front of it, right? Again, this is a trick. It's not actually what's occurring. But whatever makes a strong, it hints to what the pH is. Okay, so these two, Y and X, they would both make strong strongs, right? So the one that's greater than 7 would make a strong base, a weak acid, correct? That, that's what that's saying, at least. So is that right? I'm just trying to, to point that out, if, if that's the way that would go. So let's, sorry, let me write these out, or else it's really hard to see. I'm not writing these in, because it doesn't really matter what order I'm writing these in. So, sorry, whatever order. So if I add. OH to this one, okay, that makes a strong base. If I add an H to that, that makes a weak acid. It's a right away, that, that could be greater than seven. Let's just double check. That's OH, that's HCl, that's KOH, that's strong, strong. So for surely KCl is probably Y or X. But this is one that's a little confusing. So 
So let's talk about that for a second. If I do MgO and HSO4, HSO4 would become H2SO4, so that's acidic, right? But is MgOH, which would be MgOH2, is that a strong base? So, and you're like, no, that's not, because Mg is in the second group, and it should only be CBS. So that's a little confusing, because shouldn't that then be acidic? And it's not showing that. But the only one that for surely is going to be basic would be that one. Okay? Let's talk about a couple other things with that. Maybe we can, like, you want to double check. If you put OH in there, what does it mean for no observation? It means that it's not going to make a precipitate. So OH with NaOH, that's really soluble. You're done, by the way, right? Because NaOH, the Na is not going to do anything. It's, it would react. What gas would be made with that? The CO2? Wouldn't it be CO2? Whenever something's asking if a gas is being made, the two most popular gases usually are H2 and CO2. That's usually what's going to come off, of it, okay? So if I add HCl on there, guys, it's a double replacement reaction. The H comes on to this HCO3, and the Cl goes to the NaCl. So that's going to be a, uh, a salt. Please understand, you have to know this. If that is made, that's carbonic acid. Where's carbonation? In the soda, right? Carbon, carbonic acid makes, <coughs> bless you. you. You do need to know that. Carbonic acid breaks up into that naturally. It's not like, oh, I have to wait for an extra reaction. It will make CO2 right away. So all I'm trying to show is I'm confirming for sure that this is right. So I got that one done. So the only difference now is it makes a precipitate between these two. So I'm adding OH to something. So OH can only go on to which one? The front part, right? So it's going to make KOH or MgOH, which will be MgOH2. Well, maybe you don't know what the precipitate is, but based on those two ideas, it's either going to make KOH or MgOH2. Those are my two options for this precipitate. Even if you don't know which one is the precipitate, you should know which one isn't the precipitate. Which one isn't? Because it's an alkali metal, right? I told you from the beginning, if you know alkali metals and nitrates, and you can pick up one other thing, like PVCl and AgCl, PVCl2 is an exception, you know probably 60 to 70% of all precipitation reactions. Because if you don't know one side, you should be able to know the other. You know? So which one's which? Which one do I say? Which one makes this precipitate? OK, done. So I accidentally wrote down the answer in order. <laughs> I was writing it. I'm like, I'm not writing the order from the problem. I'm writing it down in order. But isn't that the base trick of all? What? Because I confused you? Well, if you think, maybe if you just write them down in order, you like this can't be right. <laughs> Good point. Here we go. One point is earned for one correct identification. The second point is earned for the second one. Check this out. This is smart. No points are earned if. If all three identifications are the same compound, no point, no second point is earned if two identifications are the same. What do I mean by that? Let's say you're really confident on this one, and you're like, oh, KCL, KCL. Which is really smart, but you would only get one. You gotta get all three anyway to get both. And you couldn't go Na2CO3, Na2CO3, Na2CO3. I will get one of them. They they will nip that in the bud, because then there's no real actual knowledge. Okay? I know. But pretty smart actually on their part. Letter B, right? The, okay, so now we've established something. From this point forward, this is just about reactions and interactions. Write the chemical formula for the precipitate produced when one molar of NaOH is added to a solution of compound Z. So whatever you wrote for Z, you should be able to figure that out. Well, in this case, we wrote this. Right? That, that's our Z. So all it's asking, and I just wrote that down, what is just the formula Excuse me, of the precipitate? Well, i kind of already given it away. But if, you, if you're not sure, it's a double replacement reaction. Right? All precipitate reactions that we deal with are double replacement reactions. So it sure as heck isn't going to be the Na, uh, Na2SO4 if you're like, whoa, why not? Alkali metal. Right? That's my solid. And that's all it's asking. It's not asking for the whole reaction, by the way. It's just a point. It's not asking for the whole reaction. Letter C, explain why an aqueous solution of, of compound X has a pH value greater than 7. Write an equation as part of your explanation. Okay, so this is important because 
You cannot say, so x, is x this? Right, that's x. You cannot say, well, when adding OH to it makes a strong base, and when adding H it makes a weak acid. That's not an actual thing. Okay? What, let me reread it. Explain why it's greater than 7. What has to exist in a reaction for it to be greater than 7? What has to exist? OH minus where? On the right side. If it's less than 7, H plus or H3O plus has to be on the, on the right side. So be mindful. We are doing, whenever you talk about pH, you're talking about acids and bases. So that means, you guys, that this has to exist. Let me just show you if it were acidic. If it were acidic, this is what it would look like, by the way. If you do the H3O plus, you'll never get it wrong. Right? So what does this bottom one mean? That means that this stole an H from this thing. right? This one, what is it doing? This water is giving an H to the other thing, right? So be mindful of what we're thinking about. One of these two, one of those two has to react. It's a salt. They both break off. They both don't exist. When we did this chapter, the salt problems were always going to be the hardest for you. So if I ask you which one would make sense, which is the only one that can accept an H? The Na or the CO3? CO3. So if you write that here, what's it on the other side? And you can have two different answers for this. But if you want to just be really clean, real clean, just move the H over. So this would be the cleanest way you could do it. And what do I mean by two different ways? You could make that carbonic acid potentially, but it's an acid-based problem. Just move an H and be done. You're just sliding an H one way or the other. Why am I proving again then why this is basic? Right there, right? Notice how I did this. I'm not doing this because I'm trying to teach it to you right now. That's how I would approach it. Okay, it's basic. It has to be on the right. Okay, now let me formulate my equation. Oh, it's acidic. Let me get what makes acidic solutions on the right and then move forward. But the thing I, before I leave with this, understand with a salt, both are not in the equation. It's whatever one is the active ion that is involved in creating that pH. Okay? One point is earned for identifying CO3 2 minus as a base. Ma uh, mainly, you got one point for using that. And then one point is earned for the correct equation. So, you can slow down. If you realize you're using a salt with, with a pH, that's how you got to do it. Okay, now we start to get a little more involved in a longer question. It says, one of the testing solutions used was one molar NaOH. Describe the steps for preparing, hey, for preparing 100 mils of one molar NaOH from a stock solution to three molar using a 50 mil burette, a 100 mil volumetric flask, distilled water, and a small dropper. So what I'd like, I'm going to pause this. I'm going to give you about three minutes. You can either do this on your own. You can talk with someone else. I'm not going to tell you where the points are going to come from. Let's see if we can get it. Let me repeat this, though. It says, describe the steps for preparing 100 mils of 1 molar NaOH from a stock solution of 3 molar NaOH using a 50 mil burette, a 100 mil volumetric flask, distilled water, and a small dropper. Is it asking how much, like how much also, or just what you would use? Anybody want to say their first step? Take a shot. First off, did they talk about any safety equipment? No. If they did, that's your first step. Put on whatever they tell you. If they don't tell you about that, then it's not a big deal. And never skip it. Hey, did anybody do the math? Right, Hunter, tell me about that. You mean, oh, okay, I just said add 33 milliliters of 3 molar NaOH. Okay. Hold on. Add 33 mils of three molar, by the way, what, right there, that's literally verbatim so far what it says. What did you say, solution, probably? Uh, yeah, to the three milliliters of the burette. Okay, all right, good. You're using the burette. What you could do, though, no, you could use, just you could just write, uh, deliver 33 mils of, uh, using a burette, deliver 33 mils so did you say put in a burette and then you're going to transfer it to something else? Yeah. Okay, that's great. 
So at, at some point, you could have just, I'm just going to try to shrink this up a little bit. You could say deliver 33 mils of solution from a burette. Make sure you hit the main things, the equipment. You got to hit the equipment. Um, into what? Yeah. So, by the way, just so you know, one point is earned for saying those three things. One point is earned for using the burette to dispense 33 mils of NaOH. Actually, you didn't have to say the volumetric class, but the next point uh, relates to the volumetric class. So technically, that's how you get the first point. Okay. Then, um, in general, what do you have to do? You, you put it into the, uh, technically, there actually should have been, uh, water. they didn't actually say this. In the volumetric class, there actually should have been a little bit of water first. I know we said, well, you only add acid to water. You always have some water sitting in, sitting in your solution before you add concentrated, more concentrated uh, solution. So I would actually have just be careful about it. I'd say uh, adding a little bit of water first, then adding the 32 mils. Uh, fill with H2O, probably distilled H2O. Swirl, swirl or mix. Then they went out of their way to say this. What could you do with the dropper? Use dropper. to fill with H2O to the line, the calibration mark, something like that. Okay? And then technically you could say invert, right? I mean, if you guys were like showing me, say now afterwards I cap it, I invert it a couple times, just so you know, one point is earned for adding distilled water to the calibration mark. That's the only two points. What is frustrating for me, and I have a feeling it's the same for you, where are the points from? How much do I actually write? You know, So that's why it's really important to kind of keep hearing this and, and seeing the things that they want. You, you add it to a volumetric class, you need to fill it up to the line. In this case, you did need, it didn't say show the work, but it did say you needed to actually mention the 33. So if they're ever diluting something, you need to say how much you're going to um, dispense. So that was two points um, and the top part and the bottom part. Okay, so take it for what it's worth. Put it here. Last one. Describe a simple laboratory test that you could use to distinguish between, okay, distinguish between Na2CO3 and CaCO3. In your description, specifically how the results of the test would enable you to determine which compound was which. So if I translate that, basically, is there a test you could do to see which one was which? Based on the results, why do you know which one is which? Now, you may not know both. Let me give you a hint. I haven't read this, but I'm thinking about one I could do already. There's probably, yep, there's two of them. You may not know both, but maybe you know the result of your test would, for this, would be X. Well, that, that relates to this one, so that means that that would be that or, or it would be the other one. You may not need to know the answer for both. So, either, again, you can work on your own. I'm going to give you about a minute and a half or so. All I want you to do is say what kind of test you might be able to do, and then how does the result prove how you know one or both of these, okay? So give it a shot. Okay, does anybody have one that's uh, not really all that involved? Actually, both of these are not really involved. You can do either one of these. Anybody have a thought? If you're wrong, it's good to hear it. Anybody come up with something that they wanted to try to do? Here's the issue, right? You got CO3, so if you're not focusing on that a little bit, right, that there's the differences there, then that's hard. So I mean, you could add HCl. But let's, I'm just throwing that out there. If you added HCl, well, the problem is the H gloms onto the CO3 the same way, right? And then Cl with Na, and then I don't know a lot about CaCl2, let's say. That's not really doing a lot for me. So I don't know about that. I've heard some people say some of the right answers already. So you put two salts in water, stir it up, see if one salt, uh, uh, not a precipitate, how about just does one dissolve? Because if it doesn't, I guess you're right saying the word precipitate in a sense, but precipitate is a result of a reaction, so basically it just never dissolves. If that were the case, which one would dissolve? This one? 
So this would be soluble, I'm going to write AQ once, and this would stay as a solid. Let me tell you, that's actually one of the right answers. If you're not sure, guys, just think about the fact that there's an alkali metal and not an alkali metal. You only have so many options for tests. One of them, one of them is throw it in water, stir it up, see if one dissolves or not. So all you'd have to say is the one that dissolves would be the Na2CO3. If you don't remember, and I know it's a lot of things that we're doing, but CO3s are slightly soluble. So unless if it's with something that's really soluble, they won't dissolve. Another big test is what Nate said is a pre an actual precipitation reaction, but that's usually when you're given two compounds and you're going to react them. The problem is with that, you guys, you can't react these two. So you'd have to come, you'd have to bring something else to the table, and you may not be equipped enough to really feel confident in what that's going to result. They made us too close for this to really be a precipitate. If you see like an AG or a PV in here, that's different, because then you could react it with something with like a chloride, right, or halogen. Just so you know, I want to bring this up, because there's one thing you should know uh, as a fact. If they ask you for colors of every single element, no matter what, unless you just brute memorize, you're not going to know them all. There is one you should know. They always expect you to know one of them. It's this one. It's a bright, anybody know? <laughs> I think I just heard the whole rainbow. <laughs> Blue, purple, indigo. It's a bright yellowish orange, but I always think it's yellow. It is the strongest one. It is the most vibrant. You just, you need to know that one. You need to know that sodium is yellow. I'm going to say it again in class tomorrow, just in case. Because if, if there was one flame test that comes up, it's sodium. just is. Like, if you ever put a glass stirring rod into a flame, last year you guys had to do this in your, in your flame test. Like, why does it turn yellow? Because the glass is made from sodium, from sand. And there's sodium in there. So that would have been the other thing. You could have put them both in there. I believe that that makes more of an orange, or is that a green? Oh. Or a red, okay. I don't remember it that way. Okay, so anyway, one point though for some sort of a test, and then why and how you could figure that out. Okay, that's that one. Let's flip it. What did you say for CA on that? Did you look up on that flame test? On yeah, the orange. Orange, right? So they said yellow and that said orange? Okay. That's weird that that's the same brick red. Whatever. Okay, next problem. So, uh, so I, I don't feel like we can get enough of small stoichiometry problems. I think it's important for you to see how ratios work because it will always be there. There will always be a couple points. And I know for a few of you, you might have gotten to the next level if you had gotten a couple of these right on your, um, on your final. Um, the reaction mixture contains 6.3 moles of CO at equilibrium at 327. Oh, sorry. A sample of methanol is placed in 15 liter evacuated rigid uh, tank. That means the uh, volume is not going to change. Heat it to 327. At what temp? At that temperature, all of the methanol is vaporized and some of the methanol decomposes to form carbon monoxide gas and hydrogen gas is represented in the equation below. Hey, the reaction mixture contains 6.3 moles of CO at equilibrium. I, calculate the number of moles of H2 in the tank. Okay, it tells you the moles of one thing, it asks for the moles of another. And they give you an equation on top. This is pure stoic, right? I'm going from one mole to another. If I'm asking one mole to another, that's what we call mole ratio. So start setting it up. Don't look up until you're done, because you should not have to see this. If you do, that's fine, but you shouldn't have to. It's an I problem. I am not saying that every I, double I, triple I, quadru uh, quadruple I, four uh, I, B, let's just call it that. I don't know what, how else to say that. Um, has to technically link. Sorry, bad chemistry list, or notation. From one to the next, but it's most likely that it links from one to the next. So double I, calculate the number of grams of CO3 remaining in the tank. Okay, remaining in the tank. So this is where people start to get confused already. The, just, yeah, Nick. So 
Oh, good call. Thank you. That's why. And if there's no H2, but. Thank you. I'm like, where is the H2? Uh oh. Whole different problem. Uh, there we go. Okay. I feel better. Um, all right. So calculate the number of grams of C3OH remaining in the tank. That's the key word to me. Remaining. If you look back in the problem, if it was something different, like how much was reacted or anything like that, but remaining usually goes back to the initial idea. If you look in the beginning, I have this much CH3OH. Okay, now it, it says grams, I get that, but right now I'm in the world of moles because I just had to solve for moles. I look at the beginning, and the only thing given to me about that was moles. So I need to get the amount of moles I'm just giving you a kind of a visual here I need to take the initial and I need to subtract what was reacted so what was left, what was remaining it needs to be I have found, I, I just think this probably gives most students the hardest time because I think you know a lot about all this, and yet it's hard to know how to apply it and where. So, what can I use? You're going to use a teacher. I, I'm, I need you to know what number to use, though. Yeah, Nick? You might, but. I'm just trying to think. You, you might. Uh, that's not the way they did it, and that's not where my mind initially went yet, because that's usually when they're asking about pressure or volume and things like that, because uh, they haven't asked about pressure yet, so I'm assuming they're going to. Um, what's another information? It said that everything, uh, the reaction is done and decomposes the form. If you look at the beginning part, it says the reaction mixture contains 6.3 moles of CO. The only reason how that can uh, contain that is if that is already after the reaction has decomposed and, and created everything. So. It's about, let me just kind of show this to you. It's about stoic, where if this is how much, I know this is how much CO I have, that means I can figure out how much of that I have. Now, this is not an elaborate mole ratio because it's a one to one. But that's how it would work. So technically, and maybe you could just say moles of this equals moles of that. If that's how many moles of CO are there, then that's how many moles. That's how many moles of, let me just finish writing this and try to say this in a different way, because I don't want to confuse you. You started with the left side. If now you have 6.3 on the right, isn't that how much was consumed from the left? Because it's a one to one. Does that make more sense? If I start with that, that's how much I have on the other side. So this would be 6.3 moles here. What's the whole point? Finish this up. That's how many moles I have remaining so now I just need to get it into grams. Now I just need to get it into grams. So the hardest part to me in this problem is for you to realize, OK, if that's how much was made on the right, that's how much was consumed from the left. So now you should be able to do a t-chart if you haven't, or another t-chart. So you know this is probably worth at least two points, at least. One point, Aaron. Oh my. long enough that that surprised me a lot I would have thought one point earned for recognizing how much was cons was remaining up here but that's it that's that's interpretation interpretation means that you're understanding understanding is what we're trying to do interesting 
Okay, so if you botch it, you're not, it's not the end of the world. Calculate the mole fraction of H2 in the tank. Okay, reminder, mole fraction is the moles, I'm going to write this on the side, the moles of whatever it's asking you of. In this case, it says mole fraction of H2 over all the moles. So in this case, it's every compound that's there. So you have that and this and this. All those are moles. Like you got to put it all over the total. So whatever the total is, yeah, it goes on the bottom and then use the individual moles on the top. Hopefully you've already done some of those problems or maybe you've done them all and you don't need to calculate any of it. So give it a shot. Uh, see if you got it right when, I'm, when you're done. Look through all your other problems. Or your A's and your D's. And your there is no unit for a mole fraction ever because moles cancel moles. I have a feeling it doesn't say this. It says one point earned for the correct setup. No, they gave two points for this. And you've done all the work otherwise. One point is earned for the correct setup. One point is earned for the correct answer. The issue I have is, or my question would be, what if I solve for different moles? I would assume you get the points. It does not say that, though. Please do not make a calculation mistake. That would be horrific. Worst case scenario, write the numbers on both sides first. It is a fraction. It is not a percent. You might get away with it. But if you write a percent, it did not ask for a percent. Confirm you've answered the questions appropriately. Oh, it's asking for a fraction. That's just a number. That's just a fraction. It's just a decimal. If you wanted to, technically, you probably could put 12.6 over whatever the heck that number was. Because that's a fraction, right? Like, if you were really confused and you're reading this really literally, that would probably be OK. So again, one point is earned for all of this, and one point is earned for that, which I think that's a little skewed, personally. I would have given more for problem two. So final one of uh, that side. Uh, calculate the total pressure in ATM. Now what are we doing? Total pressure. All right, so let's talk about that, though, before we, I'm going to have you do it. What have we been given? Like, if I started this problem right now, which parts could I fill in? And I know R is already filled in. What are the other ones? T, T from above. And what's, what's given without any calculations? Uh, v and T, if you're like, no, moles. Moles, in the beginning, I'm reading the initial paragraph. That's what we started with. OK, and now I got consumed. So my question is, the total pressure, the total pressure comes from all those, right? These are all gases. Do not get confused by that. And yes, they actually wrote it like that. If they're all gases, if they're asking for the total pressure of a container, they're all in there. Because you've proven that there's amounts of each. They all contribute. So what are you supposed to do? The partial pressures. Or, or, can't I take, well, Or I can do one of these. Which I think is a lot less work. Why do 3 PV equals NRT and then add up all the pressures when I can do 1 PV equals NRT and add up all the moles? That's the way I would do it. OK? So please do that. Every time I do a PV equals NRT, guys, there are two points waiting for me. I always want to do an, uh, PV equals NRT. One point is earned for the correct setup, so are you putting the numbers in the right places? One point is earned for the correct answer. So you're almost guaranteed one. Please don't forget units. Bless you. Keep pushing yourself to get three sig figs every time. Was there a problem on the test on Sunday that you graded with sig figs? No, I just wrote sig figs. Um, if you if you really botched a sig fig, I didn't take off. You guys you guys had enough to worry about there. I know no one thinks I actually have a heart.
And I probably should. Everyone always tells me every conference, be hard, grade that thing so gosh darn hard. But it's like, but it's also the final, and it's like, it means so much every single point, and keep talking through it. And, and I know if you're like, oh, you flinched. Well, yeah, that hard money one fell on me uh, last week, and it actually really hurt. This was full of money, and it hit me like right in my temple. So <laughs> I didn't know what it was coming at me. So I thought it was that. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and this is wood. <laughs> Okay, B. Again, people watching at home like, what just fell? What fell? Consider the three gases. Okay, changing the pace. Stay with it. Fight through the problem. Do not give up. You don't know how many people have bought the 180 to 195,000 people taking this on Monday. How many people do not fill these out? And the thing is, they slightly curve these depending on overall results. I don't know exactly how they do it all, but we want to be there fighting as hard as possible. Consider three gases in the tank, CH3OH, CO, and H2. I, how do the average kinetic energies of the molecules of gases compare? This is a really important question to bring back. We don't have time to review everything every single time, so a lot of these questions are bringing what we need to talk about one time. Can anybody tell me? When they say how do they compare, by the way, a few of you on your finals, you've got to have a better way of answering that. Some of them are like, it changes. Like, oh my gosh. You have to say it gets more or less. If they give you three, this one's the greatest, this one's the smallest. You cannot just say, yeah, it does. Brooke. Um, aren't they all the same because the temperature is the same? Kinetic energy. Good. You can say that? Yeah. Good. Write this down so you physically have done it. Depends on temp. Write it down. Just you, you physically have put that on paper. So. They, they do this. They will do this almost every single year. They want to know if you're going to remember it or not. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, right? Thermometer, the, the, the measure of, of that temperature, which is the measure of molecular motion. So they're all going to be the same because they're at the same temp. Same Ke because it's the same T. Let me read exactly what it has because I'm shortening mine up. The average kinetic energies are the same because all three gases are at the same temp. One point. They always follow up with this question, or almost always. Which has the highest average molecular speed? Do not get confused. Those are different things. So if you're ever confused, try to get out of your own heads and just think about what things are faster, big semi-trucks or little sports cars, big centers or little guards, you know? The shot putter or the sprinter, you know? Like, it, it's pretty, and if you're saying all the wrong answers there, I don't know what to say for you. <laughs> oh, the center? Driving a semi-truck? Throwing a shot put? If you need an equation, by the way, and if you're like, no, oh, that's about kinetic energy. I'm aware of that, but this affects that. Velocity is V. See what I'm saying? Like, kinetic energy is always present. So if you're like, well, yeah, but it's always the same at, at the same time. Yes, but the, the larger the mass, or the smaller the mass and the velocity, they, they relate to each other. So which one's the fastest? H2. H2 because it's the lightest, or it has the lowest mass. Okay. Please try not to use the words like weighs less. I don't think they're going to hit you with that. But w weight is, is more of a physics thing, right? Because it's with gravity. It's a force. It's, it's different. If you go up to the moon, your mass change. Your mass doesn't change. Your weight changes, because mass is literal stuff. So like, you don't go up to the moon and all of a sudden like your intestines are gone and your arms gone. Okay, but weight is your mass and how much gravity. So it's a force that's pushing down. Okay. It's a real small technicality and it's something I don't want you to stress out about too much. But if if you if you can try to say mass. Okay. Good question. Last one. The tank is cool. Guys, I love these kinds of questions because what it does is it can show my overall understanding without complete memorization. It's, and if you're like, well, isn't understanding memorization? I guess, I guess understanding is, is completely having an overall grasp and, and it's become part of your knowledge base, which technically you memorize it, but it's now part of your approach and, and knowledge. I'm probably not saying that well. I need to work on it. Don't let me dr write like homework. 
tank is cooled 25 degrees, which is well below the boiling point of methanol. It is found that small amounts of H2 and CO have dissolved in the liquid TH3OH. Which of the two gases would you expect to be more soluble in methanol? Explain. First off, if you don't know what it's saying, draw a picture. I'm going to do that for you. So what it's saying is you have this. Which one dissolves in the methanol? That's what it's saying, right? Did I write that down wrong? It's CO, isn't it? I'm sorry. And that's actually a big deal. I am not big. Big. When we talk about dissolving, what do we need to think about? Molarity? Oh, polarity. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, oh boy. Good, polarity. Yes. Thank you. And polarity also deals with IMFs, somewhat. Like, if you need to be specific. And actually, I don't know if they, yes, they did. Um, so always first, this is how you approach it. If you're talking about something going something else, talk about that first. Then you should discuss what both of these have. So my first sentence would say that the methanol has, it's either, well, is it polar or nonpolar? It's polar, OK? So. What type of IMF, in case you think you need it? Okay, I've established what methanol is. Okay, what does H2 have? Has LBs? Where CO has, it doesn't matter what the heck you think it looks like. There's only one option because there's just a C and an O. It's got to be a dipole because it's polar. <laughs> so which one's going to dissolve? The CO? The CO, and what you need to say, you could say because it's polar, you could say because the partial charges will be attracted to the, the hydrogen bonds. Try to be specific, though. The, the partial charge, or the, the dipoles, will be attracted to the hydrogen bonds. Something. Let me read what they have. The only attractive force between molecules of H2 and CH, CH3OH would be due to weak London dispersion forces. In contrast, the London are stronger between CO molecules and CH3O molecules because CO has more electrons. In addition, this, they shouldn't have even said that. In addition, CO is slightly polar. Thus, dipole-dipole attractions can form between CO molecules with stronger intermolecular attractions between molecules of CO and CH3O or H3OH. Let me repeat that last sentence. With stronger intermolecular interactions between molecules of CO and CH3OH. CO would be expected to be more soluble. Um, one point. How are we doing on time? We're doing fine. Any questions on that? I thought that was really, again, I, I really am trying to hand select these where it kind of hits a lot of different things. Like, oh yeah, I remember that. But it, we need to hear it. Okay. Here we go. Write the two, uh, consider the two chemical species, S and S2 minus. Oh, again, I don't know how many, I don't even need to see a show of hands, but over half of you guys did not get that electron configuration right the other day. With the SP2? No, no, that's hybridization, the uh, K plus. With oh, the, okay. And that really was hard. So, here we go. Here's your chance. <laughs> Compare with somebody at your table, or everybody at your table. What are the electron configurations for each? If you want to, you know what, push yourself. Can you also do the noble gas configuration? Because that's acceptable. What if they ask you to do that sometime? We haven't done that for a while. So do both for each. I want four of them. Try it. By the way, it's always acceptable to do the noble gas unless if they literally say, don't do the noble gas. So let's see if we remember that. This whole review, all they're going to hear is Libby talking. Because it goes right there. That's all you're going to hear. <laughs> Can you 
hear Hunter and I arguing about chips in the beginning, and then uh, maybe talking the rest of the time. If I was making him feel bad, I'd say um, his word fake. Take a break quickly for a potty break. Yeah. That was in the two. Why do I cut it off there? Because the last row is always the outer, the valence electrons, right? Neon is worth 10, right? You always go to the previous line and you pick the noble gas. I'm not going to take a break. Just quickly go. Go. Pass it. Double I. <laughs> By the way, two points. One point for each. So reminder, when it has a charge, the charge adds or removes electrons. You have to uh, reflect that. OK, double I. Explain why the radius of the S2 I, oh God, S2 minus ion is larger than the radius of S atom. So first, the nuclear charge is the same, right? It's the same number of protons. But if you start thinking about that, that helps out. So what it's saying is that S2 minus, I think they already told you it, like, I'm just, I'm just visually writing it. Explain why the radius, you should have actually been able to figure it out anyway, but it's nice that they tell you. So they're saying that the S2 minus is larger than the S. So what's the difference? There's a lot of ways you can say this. I'm curious of the exact wording they have, but you have the same amount of protons, right? Help me, help me complete my sentence here, at least the beginning of it. I'm just making a statement that's obvious without a lot of extra chemistry yet. So the S2 minus has more electrons? OK, start there. Or has a larger electron cloud? Now, this is where it gets a little cumbersome. Let me say a real technical way. Electrons repel each other, right? So if they're all in there, the more electrons, that's why the clouds actually, the more they start to get exponentially larger with larger uh, atoms because they're also repelling each other. So you've got those forces, and they're going to push away from each other more. So that nuclear charge does pull them in. If you're 16. If you have 16 protons pulling in 16 electrons here, here you have 16 protons pulling in 18, that, that overall force has been diluted, right? It, or the better word, because diluted is with solutions, weakened. So that's actually my, I haven't read it. My answer would be. Uh, the S2 minus, uh, the, the, the electron, or the protons in S2 minus, uh, their attractive force to the electrons are weakened because there are more of the ele more electrons than protons. Or something to that effect. I know I, I was a little bumbling with that. Um, I will read what they have to say. Let me write what I would, my interpretation. probably writing more than I should be. At some point, they're going to be like, they got it um, for that. Uh, this is, I, I said there's a different way you can go about it. It says a nuclear charge in 
is the same for both, but the eight valence electrons in the sulfide ion experience a greater amount of electron-electron repulsion, so this is how they went about it. Then do the six valence electrons in the neutral sulfur atom, this extra repulsion in the sulfide ion increases the average distance between the valence electrons, so the electron cloud around the sulfide ion has a greater radius. The electrons aren't being able to pull as hard as well, so, or I mean the protons. You can't talk about energy levels, okay? You can't talk about nuclear charge as being some sort of a difference. So you have to come up with something else. The only difference, no matter what, is the electrons. So you've got to come up with a reason for that. It's weakened, clouds bigger, it's going to expand more. Somehow, somewhere. Let's move on. Triple ions. What Which of the two species would be attracted in a magnetic field? I have a feeling most people forget this and or they get this wrong. You, you, you focus on the wrong thing. Can anybody remember? Are you really confident in why there's a certain answer to this? And it's not, it's okay. Evelyn, go for it. Take it home. Like something like if you don't have a full shell, you're, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. What about that full shell? There's something about it. You're right. Not as kind of. Okay, but you're on the right track. It's not the, ch the charge. What they're doing is hoping everybody just says S2 minus because of the charge. You say that it's wrong. The charge is a result of dissolving in something, and you have that, that charge now uh, that has nothing to do with the magnetic field. Let me draw something here. They made you write the electron configuration for a reason. I'm in triple I. And if you're stuck, you're like, oh, God, I don't know. What did they ask me? What are the other things they asked me? Even give yourself 20 seconds to go, why did they ask me the electron configuration? There's something about that. Which one attracts an electric field? The left. Each of these cancel out the polarity of those, uh, of those electrons. Okay? These are not being canceled out. So all you have to do is answer the one with the most unpaired, unpaired electrons. Okay? Do not say lone pair. That's a whole different thing. A lone pair is a paired electron. It's a pair. It's an unpaired electron. So it's the S because it has two unpaired electrons, while S2 minus, I want to write none, but that's not good. It has zero. Okay, the sulfur atom would be attracted in, into a magnetic field. Again, one point. Sulfur has two unpaired p electrons, which results in a net magnetic moment of, for the atom. This net magnetic moment would interact with an external magnetic field, causing a net attraction into the field. Sulfide ion would not be attracted because all electrons in the species are paired, meaning that their individual magnetic, magnetic moments would cancel each other out. Way over the top. Stay with me. Here we go. The S2 minus ion is isoelectronic with AR atom. From which species, S2 minus or AR, is it easier to remove an electron? Explain. You do not need to know what isoelectronic is, but let's say you're sitting there going, man, what does that mean? Okay, let's think about what that means. So you just had this. This is 1S2, 2S2. I'm just rewriting this. What's argon? They're isoelectronic. That's what that must mean. Whoa. Isoelectronic is a different atom or ion, different species, with the same electron configuration. So just so you understand what isoelectronic means, is you know like every ion we talk about, how either it gains, like P, S, and Cl are going to gain electrons, right, because AR. What do C, A, and K do, for example? They lose and they go to AR, don't they? So all of the ions that become po a positive or negative, when they move towards that uh, noble gas, those are all isoelectronic with each other. So th that's how that works. So what's the question? <laughs> I'm so excited about the first part. Which one is easier to remove? So they have the same number of electrons. So which one would be easier to remove? Why not? 
So what's the money word that I need to bring up? Nuclear charge. This S two minus has a smaller nuclear charge, which cannot hold the electrons as easily. What if I want to say something that they're the same about? Both outer electrons, better word, valence. Both valence electrons, uh, or sorry, both at, uh, species have the same valence electrons and the same energy level, right? So it's not about energy level. It's not about the number of electrons. It's truly about the nuclear charge. Let me read what they have exactly. It requires less energy to remove an electron from a sulfide ion than from an argon atom. A valence electron in the sulfide ion is less attracted to the nucleus, plus 16, than is a valence electron in the argon atom, plus 18. Now, they did not say nuclear charge. That's one of the first times I've ever seen that not being said. Because if you say it has a smaller nuclear charge, it's like a picture says a thousand words. You, you've already started to illustrate it. You might want to go out of your way to say 16 versus 18. It's not a bad idea, but uh, that's how it works. By the way, everything so far except for the first problem has been one point. So that's one point as well. And if you still haven't noticed on this problem, it's kind of, okay, if you didn't know that one, you move on. If you didn't know that one, you move on. In the H2S, okay, this is one of my favorite questions. This was actually in one of your big packets a long time ago. In the H2S molecule, It says that the uh, bond angle is close to 90 degrees. On the basis of this information, which atomic orbitals of the S atom are involved in bonding with the H? You're like, what are you talking about? OK, bear with me. They're basically, if they say something like that, you've got to be like, whoa, what would it normally say? If I drew that, and you're not looking at the 90, how many clouds is that? Four. And when we think four, we think like a tetrahedral. And in this case, it eventually becomes bent, right? And anybody remember a tetrahedral bent angle? Close. 109.5. Close. 105. Wait, what? Remember. <laughs> That's 109.5. That's 107. <coughs> That's 105. Every time you add a lone pair, it, it shrinks the angle a little bit. OK, regardless, please understand. These are all sp 3s Just bear with me with that. A hybrid, hybridized uh, cloud is always the same angle throughout. It just gets pushed down. This is not any of these. So my mind goes, something else is going on. This must not be hybridized. I'm just going to cut to the chase. Anybody know the name of the orbitals that are literally straight up or straight down? Or they can only do this. They can only do this. They can only do this. It's a letter. There's a certain letter. There's three of them. Well, I can go on the X, the Y, or the Z. Why I'm doing this is that that's making 90 degrees here. It can only make an X. It can only make a Y. Or I'm not going to make the Z. What, what, what is the shape of that orbital? You should know that if I drew that right now. What is that? S is this. Oh, octahedral. Oh, no. We're overthinking this now. So that's an S. What's that? What's a dumbbell? SP is a hybridization. So this is just an S. What's the next one? A P. P's only make 90 degree angles. I know, mind blow, and you're like, wow, I would never have gotten that. That's why we do these things. I've seen this come up more than once, crazy enough. So because it's a 90 degree angle, this must be a P orbital. Technically a 3P orbital because it's from the third energy level. So you're sitting there on the test and you get that problem, you're like, I don't know. <laughs> it's one point. You, you give it a shot to write a letter. Always write a letter. If they ever ask about an orbital, write a letter. And it better be S, P, D, or F. If you write any other letter, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel it. I'm going to be in my room, and I'm going to start tingling. you like, oh my god, somebody just wrote something wrong. Wait, what do you do during our test, actually? You just sit here? I see a box of chips. That's all I do. Now I have one left. Those are decisions that you and your parents and whatever else make. That's not me saying yes or no. Okay, here we go. <laughs>
two types of intermolecular forces uh, present in liquid H2S are London and dipole-dipole. I. Compare the strength of London forces in liquid H2S to the strength of London forces in liquid H2O. So you have H. Uh, Okay, please think about this really hard. It's asking about the difference between London forces. I don't want to give this away. Anybody want to tell me what they're thinking? What's the difference? Or just tell me in generalities how you would approach a problem like this. They're telling everything has London forces. They're saying, compare. they already told you. They said they have London and they have dipole dipole forces. Megan? Um, the S would be bigger. Because stronger? Yeah, stronger because it has a larger radius and more electron costs. Perfect. Anytime you're asking about London, the only difference can be the larger electron cloud, the larger atom, is the stronger LD. Because it can influence, it can have a larger uh, effect on induced dipoles. You're like, I still don't know what that means. When my cloud gets close, I'm negative. If I get close to someone else, it's negative. The, they repel each other, and the negatives get as far away as possible. And now all of a sudden, this side of me is negative, but that side would be positive, And then I can affect other people. So again, someone who's three or 400 pounds going through Lambo uh, crowds versus someone who's uh, two foot three and is like four, uh, 30 pounds, the larger person is going to affect a lot more people. I'm thinking of like a child. An elf. What? <laughs> or a child, an elf. Oh my gosh. Wait, do they have the same, the same amount of life? That's the first thing I thought. It's just there's more electrons. And, well, it's a bigger cloud because it's, it has, it's, on oh, yeah. the, it's on the third energy level. Right? This is, right? So stronger LDs, larger electron cloud. That's one point. Finalizing this. Compare the strength of the dipole dipole to the strength of the dipole dipole of the other one. So what it's asking you on that one, guys, you're like, I have no idea what he, they're asking for this. Which one has the stronger dipole dipole moment? Where does that come from? It comes from these little guys. Which one has the stronger, smaller dipoles? So this comes off of the word, what's the magic word for dipoles and things? We electronegativity. Which one has a greater difference between H? So it's always H. I mean, it's, it's already H, so now it's either O or S. So which one has a larger electronegativity? The O. It's closer to F. F is king or queen. The smaller you are, the more you can pull electrons towards yourself. So it should be the water. <laughs> the strength of the dipole dipole forces in liquid H2O is weaker than that of H2O because the net dipole moment For this. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Determine the order. <laughs> I know exactly where it was. Determine the order for the reaction with respect to H2. Justify your answer. Okay, so, guys, I did not write this part down. Here's the equation. So you can look at a problem like kinetics and go, oh, I'm done. This is not that complicated one. I picked this one on purpose because I feel like there's, it's manageable. <laughs> Ashley, I'm just kidding you. I know. Especially in the How do you do this? So when you're given amounts, what are you trying to do? You're trying to isolate the one you care about, right? So what, all right, let's bring it together here. What uh, two reactions do I want to look at that isolates H2 and doesn't allow Cl2 to influence its values? One and two, correct? Right? Yes? 
Because this changes, this stays the same. So what do we do? You divide the, the concentration over the other concentration. Guys, it does say justify your answer. The best way for me to justify an answer is by just showing the work. And then I take the rate, and I did that wrong, that's a two, sorry. And I believe I get that, right? Doesn't it look like I doubled the concentration, didn't the rate double? What does that mean? First order, right? By showing the work, that's what it is. If you feel like you gotta say more, then all you need to say, don't need to say more than this, double the, the concentration doubled and so did the rate. You don't have to start saying, so that the definition of a first order would then be, is, you don't need to say all that. I would just say first order. I believe the work would be enough. But if you really want to be as technical as possible, after the concentration, an x goes up there because it's 2 to the order gives you the rate. Translation, and I might be getting ahead of myself, if this quadrupled, right, I doubled it, and it quadrupled. Well, 2 squared is 4. Okay? Okay. Letter B. Again, actually these, I would love this for kinetics. Like, wow, awesome. Uh, determine the order for the reaction with respect to Cl2. I'd like you to try to do that yourself. If you haven't already done it. And this is a really good review of these problems. And then we're done. Right on time. That's so amazing. I might not erase it. I'm not really that worried. <laughs> What experiments did you use for that one? Letter B, what did you pick? Someone who's listening to me. Two and three. I would have expected this to be a little more challenging on this one, to be honest with you, but it is what it is. Letter C, write the overall rate law for the reaction. Guys, when I ask for a rate law and equilibrium expression, these are generic. Can you come up with this without me helping? I want a generic rate law. Remember, we couldn't write these until we knew the order. What does that look like? If you get it wrong, at least try to write something down first. You can always erase it. Give it a shot. Some of you might be over your head. Just don't fall short. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so this is a little thing, but it's important. <laughs> Got to write rate, K, and then you put all the concentrations. If it were second order, it would be like that, right? Or it would be like that. But it's not. So please, it's rate equals K times the concentrations of the different reactants only. Reactants. These are reactants. One point. And by the way, it's one point no matter what you did on A or B. If you messed up and you said second order or whatever, as long as it mirrors what you did. D. Write the units of the rate constant. OK, so if you're really good at this, you can just remember. I want to show you how you could try to remember this, though, otherwise. Rate, look at the top. It says moles, I'm just mirroring this from above, over liters times seconds. K, and then what are each of these? Moles times liter over mo or times moles times liter, right? The right has to equal the left. So if, if you're really stuck, now some of you are like, I just memorized this, I know. That worked really well when we were inside the chapter, but we've done a lot of things, and you may not remember it all. I try to teach you, you flip the molarity, and it's one less than the overall order, and then the time's still in the bottom. But, what? I'm going, well, no, I, yeah, I'm giving you a hint of how you could do it. I'm assuming people were writing there about it. Probably. People were all attentive all the same. So this is what it should be.
Reason why? Look, if I plug this into here, what does that do? It eliminates one of those. And then check it out. Moles over liters times time, right? That's what it does. See, it would kind of cancel everything but that. This is how I remember it. It's always liters over moles times time, and then this, this number right here is always one less than the order. So if it's sixth order, it's five. If it's first order, then these are gone because it goes to zero. This was second order overall because it adds up. So two minus one, because you always subtracted one, just goes to one. Oh. And well, you get the black part. <laughs> but you can figure it out that way. Please, if you're just sitting there, oh my gosh, I can't remember because I was supposed to memorize this. Write it out. Put the units. Where did I get those units? From the table. I did not have that memorized at all. Okay, only a couple left. E, predict the initial rate of the reaction if the initial concentration of H2 is that and the initial concentration of Cl2 is that. Okay. Anybody, this is not, if someone's like plugging things in, it's not necessarily um, needed that way. Can anybody tell me how they could figure this out without a, without a complicated calculation? I'm not saying type it in even to um, the rate law. Why can't I? Well, actually, you could do that. Hold on. Give me one sec. I, I think there's a way you could have done this. I want to see it before I answer this. I, I want to see it. <coughs> Sorry, just give me a sec. Okay, anybody have an idea what you could do? They, they did it an easier way, but actually my mind went to something else first. And I'm like, they didn't do it that way? Anybody have an idea? Sure. What does that do for you? Jordan? And then? Then plugging the numbers into your... That's how I did it. They didn't do it that way. What they did, you want to just look, you guys? If you look at this, what you realize, just do this or visually with me first, and then I'll show you... Jordan, we, that was, I like that one better, though, how you did it. This right here, the value, this is the same value that they gave you, if you look at the problem. But this is three times more. So basically what it is, you've tripled this one. Well, you maintain, if you maintain the same, you triple that. Well, the rate is tripled when you, you triple one of these because it's a one to one. So you could have just tripled that. What you could do is you type it in, experiment one, into your rate law. Because we don't have K yet. So like usually the problems I gave you guys is like, now find K. Now, what's the rate using these new amounts? Basically, that's what they <laughs> did without telling you what to do. So what you could have done is just pick experiment one or whatever you wanted to, put this in, find K, and then when you get your K, plug in your new numbers, I know I'm going kind of, now if you're like, this, this is overkill. Once you told me that it was just tripled, that's great. Yeah, it was. Um, but K would have been, and I, I'm not narrating this on the board as well as I should be. But it's only one point. The point of this is, if, if you can try to remember, whenever they give you a new amount in a kinetics problem and you have already been asked and, and solve for rate laws in order, you can always plug information back into your rate law. So if you could get K, then you can solve for anything. You know the order and you know your K. So if they give you amounts, my gosh, you have everything but the rate. So that's how that would work. If you didn't get it, it's only a point. I'm a little surprised. 
I would have thought that would have been worth two, potentially. But you could have done it in an easier way, because you could have just looked, oh, this value's triple. Well, that's going to affect the rate, because we know by uh, changing this, it affects the rate the same amount. So I tripled that by leaving this maintained the same, right? It's a new amount. Think of it this way, just to finish up, and I'm sorry I'm probably overkilling this. If you guys already figured out it's first order, it's like experiment four, and I tripled this, and I left this the same. So what is that? That's what it's basically saying. Oh, they're the same. I tripled it. Well, I know when I double it, it doubles. So if I triple it, it should triple. Does that make sense? Maybe? So you could have done it that way. My brain went the other way first, though. A little more work, but All right, almost done. I'm happy about the timing. We won't fall short, but we'll see where we're at. The gas phase decomposition of nitrous oxide has the following two mechanisms. So I'll give you two mechanisms. First, F. This is always a shame that you don't get this right because it's just we haven't done it enough. Write the balance equation for the overall reaction. What's your gut feeling? What do you do? They gave you two steps. To add them up, subtract, kind of like Hess's law, right? Just not with the, the enthalpies. So add them up, cross out what isn't used. Don't cross it out too hard. You might need to see some stuff. I'll say this. If you're sitting at this problem and you don't know what to do, then that should be where you go. Just like, I guess I'm going to add these up. I mean, don't start doing something really wacky. Add them up. By the way, the reason why I know that's not going to be a hard problem, you guys, is that it starts over a whole new set of problems. And even though that's not I, double I, triple I, they're probably setting me up for something larger. Okay? G is the oxygen atom. Ooh, I like this one. Oh, is it a catalyst for the reaction or is it an intermediate? So we got to remember what that means. So what did we do to the O? What? No, what, what did you do? You crossed it out, right? I mean, we, we crossed it out. So that's why it's a catalyst and an immediate. So you just have to remember, let's say justify, or explain. So by the way, all you'd have to do is explain like the order of how it exists in the reaction. So I'm not saying anything you don't see. It, it was produced, then it was, uh, the, it was produced, and then it was, uh, well, technically then it was consumed. But um, it was a product, then it was a reactant. It's probably the better way to say it. Versus being a reactant, then a product, if you need to say something. So it is a, or N. Intermediate. I always remember it this way. I, you have heard the word catalyst. You've heard things in science. Add a catalyst to speed up reaction. Or that's the catalyst that started it all. Or that's the catalyst that sped it up. That means that someone brought it to the party. That means someone brought it to the reaction. It has to be a reacted first, or it's not a catalyst. I knew about a catalyst way before I ever heard the word of intermediate. So, yeah, it's an intermediate. Let me read you what they wrote. O is an intermediate because it is formed, then consumed. Oh, they did use it. During the course of the reaction. Had it been a catalyst, it would have been present both at the beginning and at the end in that order. Last one. Identify the slower step in the mechanism if they have to tell you this. If the rate law is N to O, justify your answer. OK, you guys, if you're given multiple steps, there's a thing we learned that's called molecularity. And what it means is literally atoms or species or molecules, however you want to word it, they collide. OK, if you have two of the same one, then that would be considered like a second order. If there's one of each, then that's a first order of that and first order of that. Overall, second order because they combine. So if they tell you the rate law is a certain value, uh, a certain rate, and they give you equations, oops, I didn't write it down, it needs to reflect based on the molecules that are present as a reactant directly to what is present here. And the slower step is always the rate determining step, just like a chain is as strong as its weakest link. You can't go faster than the slowest person, the slowest reaction. So which one is it, step one or step two? And you need to explain, so I will, I will say what phrase you need to say. What is it, step one or step two? Step one. If it were step two, by the way, it would literally have this. OK? If it would reflect this, by the way, if it would reflect that, it would do that. So 
it's step one. Stay with me for an extra minute. I have a, a follow-up question that I can give you. This is going to be really short. Uh, because NO, N2O is a single reactant. That's the best way you can say this without getting wordy. Stay focused on this last problem, and then we're done. I've seen this a lot. Justify why you know, let's say they didn't give you those equations, and you already were given F. Justify why you know, according to the rate law, that this reaction in F is not a single step mechanism. It would reflect the equation, and it would be that, right? So if your rate law, this is, I'm hoping it comes up. If your rate law does not look like your equation, molecularity-wise, then you know there's extra steps. If it is the same, it could be. The problem is, a lot of people have to propose mechanisms. No one ever quite knows. This chemistry is still a mystery in a lot of ways. Thanks for coming. Hopefully that helped a little bit. Hopefully we feel a little taller, a little bigger on some of these topics.